Good evening, I'm Ian Hannah Mansing in St. Peter's Square. In just a few hours now, here at the Vatican, Indigenous leaders from Canada will meet with Pope Francis. Survivors of residential schools and their supporters have waited a long time for this historic summit to share their stories, but also to seek accountability. Tonight, what you need to know. Delegations arrive in Rome, expectations and emotions are high. I think an apology has to be done. What the delegates want from the Roman Catholic Church. I'm Janella Massa. Also tonight, Ukraine's president says he'd compromise to end the war. With Russian advances stalled, there are growing fears attacks could turn more unpredictable. With restrictions lifted, COVID spreads. COVID's still here. We still have to be careful. How bad the spring wave could get. They battled snow and frigid temperatures to make it official. It's a dream come true. For the first time in three decades, Canada is heading to the World Cup. This is The National. It is early Monday morning at the Vatican, and before most Canadians wake up, some Indigenous leaders will be sitting down in private meetings with the head of the Roman Catholic Church. The journey to this point, to this area, has been a long one and delayed just months ago by COVID concerns. The message, it's time for the Pope to apologize for the atrocities of residential schools and to deliver that apology in Canada. Residential schools were designed to supposedly civilize Indigenous people and erase their own sacred beliefs. From the 1870s to 1997, more than 150,000 First Nations, Inuit and Métis children were forced to attend the institutions funded by government but run by churches. The government and other Christian churches involved have already apologized but not the leader of the Roman Catholic Church. In addition to an apology, the delegates want the release of church records and compensation that was promised but never fully paid. Juanita Taylor shows us what drives them to stand up and be heard here. As they waited to board an eight-hour flight to Rome, these delegates, who have been meeting for months to plan their message, enjoyed a happy reunion, a good start to a trip of a lifetime. Very excited, very humble. Uh, so, so very grateful, brought memories back from my childhood and the way I was taught, and that what helped me survive the residential school. She spent 10 years at residential school after her mother died of tuberculosis. Although they tried to change us to say that our family was no good, they were savages, they didn't know nothing, my mom and dad taught us kindness, to love, respect. And, you know, we, we, that was, the, uh, that helped me survive. The discussions here in Rome will be incredibly difficult. Memories of residential school experiences will be shared, including how that has broken families. And since the discovery of what are believed to be unmarked graves at former residential school sites, the call has grown louder for an apology to be delivered in Canada. Meetings with the Pope this week are being called historic. I think it will change our country. I think that's how important it really is. And I think it'll change our country in different ways. I think reconciliation will take, take over. Now that we know the truth of what happened, I think reconciliation now will continue. This Archbishop says the Pope wants to listen to what they have to say. And, and my hope is that this is going to be for them a, a moment that's going to help in that journey of healing. That, that they're, well, not, they're on, yes, but, you know, so is the church, and in so, so many ways, so is the, are the citizens of Canada. Delegates from the Métis National Council and a small contingent of Inuit are meeting separately with Pope Francis on Monday. Later in the week, the Assembly of First Nations. Then on Friday, Pope Francis will meet with all three groups. Juanita Taylor, CBC News, Rome. 
This week, the indigenous delegates will also press the Pope to make good on an unfinished promise. They say the Catholic Church must live up to a landmark compensation agreement from 2006. Jason Warwick looked into why that hasn't been paid. That's where the actual school was. That they went to. St. Michael's Indian Residential School in central Saskatchewan is long gone. They used to have two two-story houses here. A nearby cemetery marks the graves of some of the students who died while living there. And when the snow clears, local residents will start looking for others in unmarked graves. The pain of that search could be eased if this week's meeting between Indigenous leaders and Pope Francis is successful. When but Warren C. Sequasis is skeptical of the entire process. I think an apology has to be done, but we shouldn't be have to go in there and it seems like we're begging for it again. Still, before they can even accept an apology, survivors say the Catholic Church must make good on two broken promises made in Canada's Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement of 2006. The Catholic Church still hasn't turned over all documents related to residential schools, documents both in Canada and at the Vatican, and it hasn't paid the full $79 million promised in compensation. A CBC News investigation revealed that millions of dollars meant for survivors went to lawyers and administrators instead. It also showed Catholic officials spent more than $300 million on church building projects while claiming they had no additional money for survivors. The former head lawyer for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission says the Vatican is worth billions and should pay up. The Catholic Church has played this corporate shell game around the globe. They operate hundreds, if not thousands, of corporations, even in this country, that hold their assets. One survivor who lives just blocks from the St. Michael site says she won't be able to heal until the church keeps its promises and apologizes for the pain it caused. But that thing is still in here. It's been how many years and I still, I still cry. And another promise, this one made by the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops has yet to be fulfilled. Last September, bishops promised a renewed $30 million fundraising campaign for survivors. They said all details and the plan would be released in November. But now, four months after that deadline has passed, an official says they're still working on the plan. Jason Warwick, CBC News, Saskatoon. More coverage from the Vatican ahead. One delegate described how a Catholic priest physically took him from his parents when he was a boy. Juanita will be back with his story and a deeper look at the delegates and what compel them to be here. Support is available for anyone affected by residential schools. You can access emotional and crisis referral services by calling the 24-hour National Crisis Line and you can see the number on your screen. And Janela, let's turn now to another major story in Europe, the war raging in Ukraine. That's right, Ian. And in a rare interview with Russian journalists, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky described being ready to compromise in order to end it. And the Kremlin warned it was watching Russian media and would take measures against any who published the interview. On the ground, there's no sign of ceasefire or compromise after Russia hit the Ukrainian city of Lviv far to the west. Slima Shivji shows us Ukrainians appear resigned to a long, brutal and bitter conflict. A quiet calm settles over Lviv's book market, leafing through a potential buy in what feels like a world away from the war. And from last night, when several explosions rocked the western Ukrainian city, shattering what's been a relative safe haven for many fleeing fighting elsewhere. Russia's defense ministry says it used precision cruise missiles launched from the sea at fuel storage tanks. It's the closest attack the city of Lviv has seen. Some kind of fear uh, in the air. Still, the unease doesn't phase Oleg Osini. I came from Kyiv, so... Uh... I see the most uh, dangerous uh, places. Keeping our optimism with us. And the defiance here is widespread. A month ago, we can expect the war uh, on our doorstep. So uh, we are ready for everything. 
Ukrainian forces are on the offensive in the outskirts of the capital, Kyiv. Tanks abandoned by Russian troops, commandeered and taken. But the destruction left behind by the invading forces is everywhere. In Mariupol, battered by near constant bombings, there's only charred buildings and tears. <laughs> what now? There's nothing here, she says in anguish. What is left is fear that Russia, frustrated by its stalled effort, may turn increasingly unpredictable and try to divide up the country, a Ukrainian military official warns. There's uncertainty, too, on what effect this gaffe will have from U.S. President Joe Biden. For God's sake, this man cannot remain power. The suggestion that Vladimir Putin should be ousted from power prompted feverish damage control from the White House and distancing from Western allies. I wouldn't use those words, France's president said. We don't want any escalation in a war that keeps pummeling Ukrainian cities and displacing its people. And today, confirmation that in-person talks between Russia and Ukraine will resume over the next few days in Turkey. The last round ended with both sides calling the process difficult. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Lviv. While western Ukraine remains relatively safe, the war elsewhere is lethal and unpredictable. In the north, Ukraine is pushing back against Russia's efforts to encircle cities from Kyiv to Kharkiv. Recent fighting in the east has been extremely fierce, Russia looking to break through there. And in the south, that's where Russia's scorched earth battle to seize Mariupol continues. But an even bigger prize would be Odessa. And Ukrainians know it. CBC's Margaret Evans has entered that city to find a seaside fortress. Odessa, long known as the Pearl of the Black Sea, now dressed for war. Anti-tank obstacles fill the streets of the city centre like big jacks placed by the hands of giants. And sandbags are wrapped around the opera house like a hug. The centre is now a closed military zone, IDs checked by those whose futures are now on hold, like Ilya, 23. To be honest, I don't know yet. I'm not thinking so far. I'm just waiting for this to end and then we'll see what happens. Those who experienced the Second World War, like Ludmilla, as fragile looking as the city around her, cling to the hope that Odessa will be spared. I hope so, she says. I really hope so. It is, of course, Odessa's Black Sea port that makes it so valuable. So far, Russian troops in southern Ukraine have been concentrating their efforts on cities further down the coast, to the east. But if those cities were to fall definitively to the Russian assaults, then people here expect that Odessa would be next in their sights. Up atop the famed Potemkin steps, the city's defenders wait, and local leaders, including the mayor, work to keep morale high. Here, a ceremony honoring members of the National Guard. We are not relaxing in Ukraine, says Gennady Trukhanov, and I would advise European countries not to relax either, because this is a global evil we're fighting. One of Odessa's trendiest food markets, now a humanitarian hub, supporting cities to the east. Inga Korjanovska says their struggles have taught them what to expect and to unite. We see that every city where uh, Russian soldiers have uh, came, uh, everything was destroyed. And uh, of course, even those people who say that they are not with politics, is now they understand that no, you can't be uh, out of uh, this process. They also know that it is the fighting elsewhere that's buying Odessa time to prepare. Margaret Evans, CBC News, Odessa. The U.S. Secretary of State was in Israel seeking to reassure allies ahead of a potential new nuclear deal with Iran. We are both committed, both determined that Iran will never acquire a nuclear weapon. Antony Blinken today ahead of a rare Arab-Israeli summit. The U.S. has been trying to revive the 2015 nuclear accord, which the Trump administration withdrew from in 2018. Under the deal, Iran agreed to curb its nuclear program in exchange for sanctions relief. 
Israel firmly opposed those terms, arguing they would embolden Iran. To a developing story we're following tonight, CBC News has learned the province of Ontario has reached a deal with the federal government to bring $10 a day childcare to the province. Travis Danrash joins us now from Ottawa. Travis, what do we know about the deal so far? Well, Janella, after months of back and forth between the feds and the province, an announcement is expected tomorrow morning. And this is what we know right now. The deal commits to $10.2 billion for Ontario over five years and will create 86,000 new childcare spaces by 2026. It will mean a reduction in fees almost immediately, around 25% to start and then another 25% by 2026. That is a big deal here in Ontario. Childcare costs can be over $1,800 a month in some cities like Toronto. And so this will mean major financial relief for some families, Janella. Hmm. And it should be noted that Ontario is the last province to sign a deal like this. Tell us a bit more about the politics behind all of this. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So the province has argued all along because Ontario has the largest population in the country and has a complex child care system, a different funding formula than other provinces needed to be applied. Now, the province is getting more flexibility over how it can spend the money over the five-year term and additional money outside of that five-year agreement to help reach the $10 a day target uh, is going to be had as well. Now, it's unclear at this point how much extra money that is, and all of this comes, of course, amid the backdrop of a provincial election campaign. So if Premier Doug Ford is able to announce substantially more tomorrow for holding out, it could be seen as a political win. But there's also a risk here that if the deal is almost identical to other provinces, Janela, he could be seen as dragging his feet. All right, CBC's Travis Danrash in Ottawa tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you. Most provinces drop their COVID restrictions across the country. Many are holding on to their masks for now. Experts say Canada is moving into another wave of COVID-19. As Farah Morali explains, they're keeping a close eye on hospitalizations. It's been nearly a week since mask mandates were lifted in Ontario. But most clients at this salon are keeping them on. Have a good day. They come in and they already have the mask on. They, want it, they choose to keep it on, so, and that's okay with us. As public health measures loosen, wastewater monitoring data suggests cases are rising in many places. Certainly, if mandates are lifted, you expect to see more transmission. Experts say the more transmissible variant of Omicron could also be to blame. We expected to see uh, an increase in the number of COVID cases simply because BA2 is here. For some kids returning to school after spring break in BC, it's creating anxiety. Masks won't be required in class. I feel that it's a bit too early. Many experts say the question is no longer, are we headed for a spring wave, but rather, how severe is it going to be? Without widespread testing, one of the key metrics they'll be looking at is hospitalizations. Data shows on average the number of COVID patients in hospital in Canada declined last week. But on a provincial level, there's been a recent uptick in places like BC, Ontario and Newfoundland. We do have significant community level protection, but it's still unknown to what extent that's going to help us and to what extent subsequent waves are going to impact us. In Quebec, hospitalizations are climbing outside of Montreal, but that's not the only concern. A lot of healthcare workers have been exposed to the virus recently. Back at the salon, the owners say they're continuing to encourage staff to keep masking. For the most part, we're all wearing our masks, but um, I think it makes people a little bit more at ease. At ease during a time when much uncertainty lies ahead. Farah Morali, CBC News, Toronto. All right, some good news tonight. A thrilling victory for Canada. After 36 years, the team has qualified for the World Cup with a 4-0 win over Jamaica. As Jamie Strachan shows us, it was played under some very Canadian conditions. For Canada, the party started early and didn't stop. On a day better suited for an outdoor hockey game with the temperature dipping below zero, Canada's men's national team seized the opportunity, giving this sold-out crowd an enduring moment they expected to see. Our country needs this. It's a way to bring us together, especially after all we've been through. This is means more than just sport. Fans came from every corner of the country, 
Ready to experience a game many thought would never happen. You can't miss it. You know, it's like this is the biggest game in Canadian soccer in three or six years on the men's side. So you got to come to Toronto. It's going to be a big party today. For years, Canadian soccer fans have had to cheer for other countries at the World Cup. Not anymore. You support teams, but it's different when you support your home country. And I get to see Canada at the World Cup, so it's a dream come true. The Kings of the North, they've done it! Canada is going to the World Cup! This run to the World Cup has been 36 years in the making. But this is a new team that has caught the world's attention. So many disappointments through the through the through the years, and uh, this is the new Canada, new brotherhood, uh, new family, new everything. Four years ago, head coach John Herdman predicted this, but given Canada's mediocre soccer history, few believed him. It seemed like he was selling a little bit of, of some fairy dust, but for us on the inside, and that's all that really mattered. It was it was something that we really felt like if we put our minds towards it. We can, we can really do that. On Friday, the draw for the World Cup will be held and Canada's initial opponents will be revealed. Another chapter in what was once a dream, but not anymore. Jimmy Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. Celebrities hit the red carpet for the Academy Awards for a showing like it's 2019 again. We are going to be interrupted. Oh. But while the stars are back, will the TV viewers return? We're at the Dolby Theatre for the glitz and glamour. Plus, a wedding photographer turns his lens to the war. My camera is my weapon because I can, I can tell the truth. I speak with a photographer who's capturing the destruction in his hometown. But first, here at the Vatican, just hours from a meeting that Indigenous communities have been waiting for for years. The Roman Catholic Church has to admit uh, for each role for cultural genocide. But will it meet expectations for survivors of residential schools? We're back in a moment. Tonight at the Vatican, the stillness gives no hint that history is about to be made. Indigenous delegates from Canada set to start private meetings with the leader of the Roman Catholic Church. They want the Pope to understand the damage their families and their culture was forced to endure when his church helped run the residential school system for more than a century. Juanita Taylor is back with a deeper look at some of the delegates and their haunting family stories. Adeline Weber cradles a family heirloom, delicately sewn out of tanned caribou hide, the beading intricately stitched. These moccasins will be with Weber when she meets the Pope in Rome this week. I'm going to bring this little pair of moccasins. My mother made these many years ago, and my three children have worn them. And I just thought, if I take this, you know, that... It'll, it'll comfort me. Weber is a member of the Teslin Plinkett Council, a self-governing First Nation in Yukon. She's a residential school survivor who has been selected by the Assembly of First Nations to take part in its delegation to meet Pope Francis in Rome. It's important to me and it's important to my family uh, that we, we at least have some closure Weber and her eight siblings attended residential school. One of her brothers never made it home from Tlucha Residential School in Carcross, Yukon. When he was about six, he died in the residential school. We found out that he had measles, and um, he's buried in Carcross, but we don't know where his grave is, and my mother never ever knew where that was. Weber wants the Pope to listen to her story, to hear the impact of that pain in person. Now we're facing up to the people that started this whole situation that broke up our families. A thousand kilometers away in Fort Simpson Northwest Territories, two residential schools once stood on the traditional land of Lidlikwe. 
Pope John Paul II visited here in 1987. This teepee was built in his honour. Regional Chief Gerald Antoine was there. Nobody ever thought that uh, a person of that significant would come to our community. Regional Chief Antoine attended La Pointe Hall in his village as a child. Now, he's leading the AFN delegation in Rome. He still thinks about what Pope John Paul II said to his people in 1987. Yes, you have self-determination. Yes, you have land, you have a way of life. And it really has helped us to feel that uh, finally we're being acknowledged as human beings. But what the Pope didn't offer that time was an apology for the church's role in residential schools. Regional Chief Antoine says he wants to hear Pope Francis say that he will deliver an apology in Canada. There's an expectation. There's also the feeling in our people that that needs to happen. And so I have a really strong sense that it will happen. The apology is called to action number 58 in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's final report. Pope Francis has committed to visiting Canada at some point to work on reconciliation. It was quite a controversial call to action internally even among the commissioners because we also heard many survivors say, I have never set foot inside a church since I left residential school. I never intend to set foot inside a church again. But we also heard from many survivors who said that the church had actually played an important role in their healing, that uh, their traditional culture and spirituality was very important to them, but so too uh, was the church and their connection to the church. This isn't the first visit to the Vatican made by survivors of residential school. In 2009, Pope Benedict invited a Canadian delegation for a private meeting to discuss their experiences with the Indian residential schools. I prefer to say that I was kidnapped in broad daylight right in front of my parents by a Roman Catholic priest in August of 1958. Going to a residential school very foreign to our uh, Inuit culture, Inuit customs and traditions, was very, very traumatic also. Peter Elnick was part of the 2009 delegation, but not part of the private meeting with the Pope. He says at that time, Pope Benedict was to make a statement of reconciliation, to acknowledge that Indian residential schools are to blame for the loss of culture. That he understands the pain and suffering that's been endured that he is sorry that uh, we were forced into this tragic situation. But there was no formal apology from the Pope. I came away feeling empty coming back to Canada at that point because I never feel that um, he made a statement of reconciliation to the Indigenous people of uh, Canada. And I still feel that way today from that experience. Ilnuk is not going to this meeting in Rome, but he does have high expectations of this visit. Look, there was a cultural genocide by the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church has to admit uh, for its role for cultural genocide to the Inuit of Canada. That is the purpose that I would like to see this delegation going to Rome uh, to speak to um, uh, Pope uh, Francis about. For some survivors and their families, an apology from the Pope would be a step in healing. Métis National Council President Cassidy Karen plans to bring that message to the Pope. A lot of our survivors have told me that this is the piece that's missing right now along their healing path. They need the Pope to know the full story of what happened to me, to people in residential schools, in order for them to be able to move on and heal in a good way. And so that's why it's really, really important to us. For Adeline Weber, when she speaks to Pope Francis, she says she'll get her strength from her mother. My mother was a really strong, resilient woman. I wouldn't have been able to to do what she was able to do with all the her children taken. Uh, 
I always admire her. Well, we need it. We're just hours away now from the first in the series of meetings. And I know for some of the delegates, a lot of emotions, an exciting time, but it may be painful as well. Ian, it's definitely going to be painful for some of the delegates who are going to be reliving some of those memories that they've held for so long. And that's why the three Indigenous groups, they're going to be bringing support workers with them to help be with them every step of the way. And Ian, we saw that some groups, some delegates are bringing sentimental items with them, like Adeline Weber, who we just saw in my story. She's going to be taking with her the beaded caribou hide moccasin slippers that her mother made for her and her children so many years ago. All right. Well, lots of stories still to report. Look forward to hearing from you again tomorrow night. Thanks. Thanks, Ian. And tomorrow I'll be sitting down with two delegates after they've had their meeting with the Pope to get their perspective from inside the room. We'll bring that to you right here on The National. And so, Janella, that's all we have tonight from Rome. Thanks so much, Ian. After the break, a photographer whose job was capturing joyous moments until the war started and everything changed. I told that my camera is my weapon because I can, I can tell the truth. How he's coping with the grim realities in his hometown. That's next. Welcome back. The war has upended the lives of Ukrainians, with many being forced to make impossible decisions, forced to do things they never imagined they'd have to do. Pavel Dorogoy is a photographer living in Kharkiv, and when the Russians invaded, he went from photographing the joy of weddings and the beauty of architecture to documenting the stark devastation of war. I spoke with him about that painful shift in the situation in Kharkiv now, a warning that some of the images he's captured are distressing. What was the moment when you realized everything has changed? Nothing is going to be the same. The 1st of March, when I see the destroyed admi uh, the, the original administration building in the center of the city, this is like the main square of Kharkiv, the heart of the city. I go there maybe one hour after the missile attack, maybe a little bit more, and I see this the total destruction because there is no windows there is no doors and the wall was breaking in, in the first floor uh, yeah and that's what like yeah that's what's moment when i go oh shit like this is this is it's happened so it's not a, it's not a dream so it's it's reality so pavel i want to ask because what was it like to go from shooting weddings the happiest day of someone's life to shooting this tragedy and people in their darkest moment um, how to answer the question? I don't know. Like I, 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 th I think I will think about it after the war. I think I will get a lot of therapy after the war, and we will talk about it, what I feel, like what mood is, like what. Now I, now I just I do it. So I, every Ukrainians now try to do the best, like what they can do. Every time I see the dead body i didn't see like a lot I, I i i i'm glad of this but i see more dead bodies than i see like through uh, my life the whole of my life so and, and uh, i think it will be me like a long time i don't know like I, I i sleep well i eat well so i i i am okay but every time it's painful uh, see the destruction to see the people to see even like the not the death, but like the people suffering, like crying because like they are flat or destroyed. I make the picture of the old, old woman. I think she was the child in the Second World War. So this is like not the first war for her. So, and I saw in her eyes, like the, the, the scared, like misunderstood, misunderstanding. What's happening? Like what? What? What next? Like so, it it was like a lot of emotions in her eyes, and I saw this old people and newborns with and mother with child in this shelter with people with cats, dogs. So it was like crazy. Like people just sit like next to each other. Like so, it it was like a couple of thousand people there. So it it was really insane. Is it ever difficult? to just stand back and observe and capture. Tell me a little bit about what you're seeing. I can just like 
stand back and observe because like this is my hometown and every time i like see it i feel pain that's why maybe i sh i try to shoot it because like, it's helped me to accept this like that this is happening you're saying in a way you're not really processing it right now you think you'll process it later but also how you're processing it is through your camera I told you this. Like this is like the reflection. So I I told that my camera is my weapon because I can I can tell the truth uh, to people who who didn't believe maybe or he or who didn't see. So I can truth there what's happening. But this is my shield because like I am hiding behind the camera. Every people not tell me that oh you are so brave you are so I like. Uh, I don't know, like, uh, maybe, I don't know, I just, like, do, trying to do my best, like, what I can to do, it's, like, this is one of, that I can do, like, tell the stories by uh, images and try to show the wor world what's happening. Okay, my last question to you is then, what is your hope for the future of your city, of your country? We're one month into this conflict. What's your hope for the future? We all hope that it will end tomorrow. <laughs> uh, maybe not tomorrow, but after tomorrow. <laughs> um, we all live now like, in one day. We don't have tomorrow. Like, we have only now. And sometimes it's great because you feel uh, like the, the every moment is, you feel like the full moment, you know, like if you like drink tea, it's a, best tea that you drink or coffee that best you drink or maybe if you take a shower like you feel like the warm water and maybe like it's talking with friends uh, life and maybe meet some great people listen music it's like it's every moment it's great because it can be it can be the last one well for now Dorogoy says he plans to stay in Kharkiv to document the war since the invasion, officials say half the city has fled, including most of Dorogoy's family. Well, the war in Ukraine is also casting a shadow over the Academy Awards this year. The refugee pin is to remind everybody about the amount of displaced people in the world right now. We're on the red carpet as the Oscars tries to find its footing post-pandemic. To a go public investigation now. A Toronto man paralyzed in a fall years ago is now struggling to pay for basic medical supplies essential for his everyday bodily functions. The costs aren't covered, forcing him to regularly put his own health at risk. As Rosa Marcatelli explains, advocates say it's an issue facing many Canadians. So this is what a night bag looks like. Paralyzed from the chest down, Chris Stigas has to use catheters and other medical supplies to urinate. He says he has no choice but to roll the dice on his health every day, risking serious infection by reusing supplies because the health care system won't provide what he needs and he can't afford to pay for them himself. It's a constant um source of anxiety. An estimated 47,000 Canadians with spinal cord injuries use catheters, but Canada's so-called universal health care system is leaving many short, say advocates. That's because a patient's ability to get the medical supplies he or she needs depends on what province they live in or the ability to pay out of pocket. There really isn't a standard of practice across Canada. Others with spinal cord injuries report intentionally dehydrating themselves to avoid filling their bladders, boiling medical equipment to try and disinfect it, and using cheaper unlubricated catheters which double the chances of infection. That seems completely unbelievable that we all live in Canada and between us there's different levels of coverage for medical supplies when it should be the same for everybody, a spinal cord injury is a spinal cord injury. For example, Ontario, Manitoba and British Columbia are among the provinces with the least access to funded programs. Alberta and New Brunswick offer partial coverage tied to income. Saskatchewan, on the other hand, is considered the gold standard by advocates based on the needs of the patients with no eligibility restrictions. It makes me feel like a second-class citizen. In Stigas' home province of Ontario, the health ministry tells Go Public it's not planning any changes. Health Canada isn't either. It says medical devices are the jurisdiction of provinces and territories. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Calgary. 
Well, Elton John is among the celebrities paying tribute to Taylor Hawkins, the Foo Fighters drummer who died Friday. Um, he was one of the nicest people you could ever met and one of the greatest drummers. During John's concert in Iowa, he dedicated a song to Hawkins, Don't Let the Sun Go Down on Me. Hawkins died in a hotel room in Columbia. Preliminary toxicology tests found opioid and several other drugs in his system. After a scaled-back ceremony last year due to COVID, the biggest night in Hollywood returned in full force tonight. Are you excited to announce Best Picture? Oh, yeah. And oh, the yeah. Oscar goes to... Okay, Coda. <laughs> Coda, the film about the child of deaf parents, wins Best Picture at the Academy Awards. Let's bring in Eli Glasner, who's on the red carpet tonight. Eli, we've been talking lots about waning ratings at the Oscars, and tonight Will Smith uh, gave them a, a moment that everyone is talking about, uh, and not just his win for Best Actor. Take us through the night. Yeah, before that win, uh, Chris Walk was on stage, he was introducing the documentary category. He's a comedian, he was making jokes, but he made a joke at Will Smith's wife's expense, Jada Pinkett Smith, who has alopecia, a condition that causes hair loss. Well, here is how it began with that joke. Jada, I love you. G.I. Jane 2, can't wait to see it, all right? Now, so after that, Will Smith steps on stage. As you'll see, he struck the comedian, striking him, and that's not all. Then Will Smith went back to his seat, saying to Chris Rock, keep my wife's name out of your effing mouth. He said that twice, quite angrily. It was not a bit, it was not a joke, and you could see that Rock on stage was shaken. Later on in the show, a very emotional Will Smith wins for his performance as the father of Venus and Serena Williams, playing King Richard himself, essentially, and uh, seemed to sort of reference what happened in a way in his acceptance speech. Let's take a look. Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> Richard Williams um, was a fierce, defender of his family. He did apologize to the Academy and to his fellow nominees, but notably not to Chris Rock. Uh, that big moment kind of over overshadowing everything else, but it was a big night for other people. Tell us about some of the other big winners. Amazing night for Dune came into this, uh, this awards with 10 nominations, winning so many categories. Remarkable accomplishment by Denny Villeneuve and some Canadians winning like uh, Patrice Vermette, uh, the production designer for Dune. Also an amazing night for deaf actors and Troy Katsur, who becomes the first male deaf actor to win an Oscar. Dad, I learned so much from you. I'll always love you. You are my hero. Coda is the best picture winner. It is a screenplay winner, and it is uh, going to put a statue on Troy's mantle at home. This is an actor, Gene Janela, that he almost was going to stop acting before he auditioned for that part. Wow. Eli Glasner, thanks so much. Canada's soccer win is not, the only, is not this weekend's only moment to celebrate. Oh, Canada. The Habs taking steps toward reconciliation with a night of Indigenous celebration. A hockey night tradition took on special meaning last night at Montreal's Bell Centre. Before the Canadians took on the Toronto Maple Leafs, fans heard the national anthem in three languages, French, English and Cree. Performing the anthem was singer-songwriter Picasso Mukash. He's originally from a Cree community in northern Quebec. And tonight his rendition is our moment. Oh, Canada, that special performance kicked off the Canadians' first ever Indigenous celebration night. Oh, Canada. And Indigenous cultures were honoured throughout the night. Josh Anderson. Announcing the starting lineup was a young Innu ambassador from an organization supporting indigenous youth. 
And for the warm-up, Habs players wore special jerseys as a tribute to Orange Shirt Day. The jerseys created by Mohawk artist Thomas Deere are now being auctioned off to help support Indigenous youth organizations. Well, specially designed hats, jerseys, and T-shirts are all for sale. Uh, and there was also an auction raising funds, all that money going to organizations for Indigenous youth groups. That's it for us here on The National this March 27th. Have a good night.